I used to do lots of things. I used to do things and I'd say things and Jesus, I was evil. Say things and break things and Jesus, I was evil. I never should, baby. All right, everyone. Welcome to episode 40 something. Of the breakfast 40, newscast, forty-three, I right? Think it's forty-three. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're getting up there, man. We're getting old. Getting old. It's gonna have to <laughs> hang up the cleats soon. <laughs> oh man. Um, so what's going on with you? You're, you're working. You're still working on your novel. Yeah, uh, I'm almost finished with the first draft to the sequel to my last novel. Nice. No. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably finish. I'll, I. I would be shocked if I didn't finish it this month. Right. So, and then um, that process starts, which is, you know, that's like the first like butt ass naked draft. Like no one sees that. Not even my editor. I, yeah. I print it. I hand, I read through it and hand do hand notes and then add those uh, changes to the draft on my laptop. And then that goes to my editor. So, right. I do a I do a read through first, but this has taken a little longer uh, than last time. It's going to end up probably around a similar word count than than the first one, maybe a little right. less. But right, yeah, I've been at it for probably like a year and a half. I'd have to check yeah. my notes. Nice, yeah. man. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to uh, we'll have to do an episode uh, uh, talking about it. I'm just going to read it the entire episode, <laughs> <laughs> and I will just sit quietly. Just <laughs> I'm just going to read the novel and you have to sit and listen <gasps> oh my god <laughs> um yeah no seriously now uh uh when when you uh uh get ready to release that we can we can talk about it it's, so it is it's it's uh it's a dystopian mm -hmm. uh thing yeah it'd be cool yeah. to, to like we can do an episode on like world building or something like that you know like how to like definitely yeah that would be fun yeah so it's cool. different because it's world building but it is like the earth it's not like yeah. middle earth or right, right. Earth or something so it's not that kind of world building but it's it takes place um about 100 years in the future so yeah 2119 you know when i did the first one i wanted it to be like 100 years but that's a few years ago so yeah. you know it's around that 2119 2120 um so about 100 years and um I, I do a map in the beginning that kind of shows okay. what the earth looks like and i mean i'm not gonna uh, it's hard to be right about everything like that's how right. i feel when i write this because so many i'm joking but so many <laughs> like a lot of things are coming true like way before yeah. like one of the examples i gave is in the first one in this hyper progressive country called progressium uh, they <laughs> use this term called bipoc plus and like i wrote that <laughs> yeah. i swear to god i wrote that and published it and yeah. then i start seeing it on twitter like legitimately not satire like so I start seeing that i have russia like the russian empire comes back and basically takes over europe because yeah. the united states which doesn't exist anymore that's called the great american union doesn't intervene we yeah. kind of go west all the way to asia right. um it's I, I won't recap all of it but it is right, right. and like women in the gau like don't have bodily autonomy basically so like we're seeing a lot of that now with yeah. the uh, like a like a abortionists are executed and you know it's it's contrasting it's very political but it's yeah, yeah. it's a dystopian so everything's kind of extreme yeah, yeah. it's kind of like pick your poison right um, right the cartels no, that's cool. have, yeah the cartels have completely taken over mexico and and the south of that like that's basically a cartel run state which i mean that's the way it's gonna go which actually brings me into my next topic. I want to ask you kind of a personal question. Yeah. How do you feel about all the Californians moving to Mexico City? Uh... <laughs> I tried to get to it. <laughs> 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 Did you uh... see that in the LA Times? No, I didn't. I, oh I, my I saw God. that it was in your Twitter thing. Uh, yeah. I, I think I saw something briefly about it, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> it's like I, there are <laughs> signs in Mexico City, like Americans go back to where you came from. I'm like, God <laughs> damn, I love this so much. It's like, that's globalism, <laughs> baby. That's funny, man. It's so like all of the, cause, well, and it makes sense because all of these 
uh, consultant class, pajama class, overwhelmingly liberal people. Yeah. They're like, well, I can go work my six figure salary job that usually is in, you know, the Bay Area or LA or New York. Right. And right. just go live somewhere cheaper. Yeah. And now it's like, well, let's go do that in another country. I mean, yeah. you watch House yeah. Hunters International, like a lot of times it's just, we can both work remotely. We're moving to Costa Rica. Like, I mean, right, it's like right. tons of episodes like that. It's not like, oh, my job got moved to Paris. Sometimes it's that. But sure, a lot sure. of them are just like, we can move wherever we want. And that's globalism, yeah. baby. And here we come. And now yeah. the, the the Mexicans are like, get out of our country. <laughs> <laughs> swear to God. There are menus in English and people are getting pissed off. It's like, yeah. I swear to God, it's, it's you know, same side of uh, uh, both sides that's same funny point. man yeah, that's hilarious funny. and i was wondering what how you felt about that i don't know too much about it but based on your description it sounds pretty hilarious uh yeah. i think it's pretty great i'm a pretty terrible mexican though <laughs> uh, so, it reminds uh, did you ever watch portlandia a few episodes there was one where fred armerson plays this mexican artist and some chick yeah. uh, she owns like a coffee shop or something and she hires him to create uh, a tip jar but it's a super passionate Mexican artist. And then he's like, you know, I'm from Mexico City. You know, you should you should go to Mexico City because that's where that's where everything's happening. You know, we got everything in Mexico City. We got, you know, Xbox is in Mexico City. And it's, but they're like, okay, but what about my tip jar? Like I put down deposit yeah. and it goes, don't talk to me about money. You know, I'm from Mexico City. You know, like I don't I don't measure time the way you do. You know, sometimes like the sun comes up and we don't even know what month it is. <laughs> 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 and he goes well, you know, every, every day we spend all day eating lunch that's what we do we sometimes yeah. we go to bed eating lunch and then the lady's <laughs> like i've been to mexico city nobody eats lunch in mexico city <laughs> but, <laughs> um, aren't you guys like aren't you guys like tejanos though like weren't you like way far back or you... yeah well for my dad's side well okay so my mom's dad and my dad's dad have a lot of family in texas like that's that's kind of like where like yeah. my grandfather's side of the family uh comes yeah. from but my my grandmothers i think were uh well even that like my both my grandfathers their family was from colima which is next to a volcano we're in mexico yeah oh. yeah um but uh yeah uh um, yeah mexico city dude they got xbox there have you been to mexico uh <laughs> yeah but only for uh it was very usually it was like a cruise thing you're just like spending a day and so it's like the the whitest non-mexican yeah. thing way yeah, to go to mexico gimmicky, gimmicky, gotcha. uh, um, All right. yeah it's cool that's very authentic joe so yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and the um, other thing i wanted to ask you is uh yeah. you were you told me that you almost got raped the other day do you want to go into detail about that Yes. I have notes here. I have, by the way, I like to show my notes. The first one says, Joe almost raped. And the other <laughs> is uh, Californians <laughs> moving to Mexico. Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah, I was almost raped. But to be fair, though, like I was dressed kind of slutty. So I, I had it coming. Yeah, no, the, um, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, real quick, that does remind me a little bit. There was, a, a, I, I, I read a snippet from. Uh, a previous draft of Total Recall, the, the the Schwarzenegger, where Schwarzenegger goes to Mars and kills a bunch of people. You just read movie scripts? No, I, I can't remember where I read this. I think it was in a screenwriting book, and but yeah. it had it had an excerpt of a previous draft, not not what ended up in the final thing. But in this future, there's a part where Schwarzenegger's character and Sharon Stone's characters uh, they're watching the yeah. news in the future, and then yeah. in the on, on the news in the background, like the news the news reporters talking about a man who got gang raped by a bunch of women. And then, like, uh, <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then, and then, what? Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, this, so this wasn't in the movie. It was not in the movie. It was okay, because I watched the, I watched the movie a couple of years ago. I don't, I don't remember that. But yeah, I love that movie. But there, yeah. uh, uh, the, the, a previous track, It was a guy who got raped by a bunch of women. And then, and then they were doing, they were doing that thing where they're. In, I think they were interviewing people on the street. Like, oh, so how do you feel about this case? And then one of them was like, well, he was. Did you see the way he was dressed? He was asking for it. That's funny, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Well, that was that was the eighties, like late eighties, right? It was. It came in nineteen ninety. So yeah, right. Oh, it was nineteen ninety. They, they, they filmed it in Mexico City, actually. Really? I know, yeah, they actually did. Yeah, I love the um, the scenes that are like where the like the CD bar is. Yeah. Like those kind of like winding streets. Those scenes are so cool. That that's yeah. Paul Verhoeven, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love he's great. I mean, Starship Troopers. I've talked about a lot on the show. Is one like one of my foundational movies of my childhood 
that's one of those movies that when I watched it when I was younger, I was like, it's a cool, fun sci-fi action movie, whatever. But then I, when mm. I watched it later on, I was like, no, this is actually really good satire. It's, it's amazing actually, satire. Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah. Robocop, same thing. I love Robocop. I was actually right before, like literally I'm waiting for your, uh, your link to uh, this episode. I was uh -huh. watching 10 like best satires of all time. Yeah. The list, the Cinefix list. Yeah. And yeah. I don't, I mean, I think satire is kind of a broad term. Some of these I'm like, wait, that's a satire, but they had, uh, I, I think they were getting to Robocop. They had yeah. bamboozled for, they're doing like topics. So like race was bamboozled politics was something that came out in 2009 i actually hadn't heard about it but it sounds good yeah. um they had um for uh, i'm drawing a blank and i just saw this hmm. oh broadcast no not broadcast news what's the one where it's like i'm mad as hell and i'm not gonna take oh. it anymore ah Sydney yeah yeah is it was it was it newsroom something or... like that not i know what you're what... talking about I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, well, that was on it for like media. Yeah. Anyway, um, so that's one of my favorite, one of my yeah. favorite. Um, yeah, we should do an episode genre. dedicated to that. Well, I just read when I did a solo episode. I read one of the greatest pieces of satire of all time. But which, I wasn't on it, so that doesn't count. That was that's true. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's why it's such a popular episode. Um, <laughs> true. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, what did I, oh yeah, I was about to get raped. Yeah, you're getting um, raped. Yeah. I was in the middle. You of literally texted me, and I'm like, "Call the police." <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't that harrowing. So okay. So no. I went to. So I went to two art shows in one night because I'm kind of a. What you think you're better than me? Yeah, I do. L.A. has ruined me. Uh, it's turned me quite the snob. Um, mm. But uh, 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 so I went to. The, I went to these two art shows. One was like this. Uh, some some Grammy winning hip hop producer guy. 99% of the time, whenever somebody who's become prominent in one industry, when they start to go into another industry, specifically yeah. creative industry, it's usually not very good. And this was, you know, uh, proof positive of that. Um, so he so was this a, guy is a hip hop producer who now is doing art painting. Yeah, he's, he's a painting. painter now. Um, okay. It was not very good. But I was there because it was free and they had free alcohol. And uh, it was on Melrose Avenue, which is kind of a cool hip place. So I thought, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll go on Friday night, whatever. Sure. So I'm there. And so they had this little this little multimedia room where they had, like, on one screen, it was him. It was a video of him painting. And on the other one, it was him, like, you know, playing with a stupid keyboard thing, trying to make art or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I go in there. And there were a couple of chairs. So I go in there, and I'm just drinking wine. I'm just kind of absorbing the atmosphere. And then this old guy comes in, and he sits across from me. And he's, he's trying to, like, make chit-chat with me. And he's like, oh, yeah, this is pretty cool, huh? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And he said something else about the art. I was like, oh, yeah, definitely. I know, yeah. And mm -hmm. then, uh, this guy's kind of weirding me out because he keeps trying to chat with me. And I was like, all right, I got to go. So I leave. Um, and then I walk around the gallery some more. And I'm drinking and more. And then he leaves. And he's walking around, right? And I go back inside because, again, no one's in there. So I'm like, all right, cool. I'm going to sit down and drink some more. And he comes back. And it's just the two of us in this room. And he comes back. And he starts making more chit chat and he goes, Yeah, I can't believe that they're selling that painting for you know ten thousand dollars. I was like, Yeah, and he goes, But you know, it only took him 15 minutes to make it. I was like, Yeah, I know, yeah. And he's just like a, but yeah, he expresses himself so beautifully. I was like, Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. And so I get out eventually because I'm tired of him. And I'm walking around the gallery, and then I think when I was texting you, I was like, Yeah, this guy, this old guy keeps coming into this room whenever I'm in there. He's little? Uh no, he's probably average size, but could you have taken him? Uh, oh, I don't know. Actually, I, I think I think if he had, he probably could have had his way with me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> should have been like you. But you know, I'm willing to do things for ten thousand dollars too. <laughs> I only need fifteen minutes. I almost so when I was texting you this this because you know like I guess it wasn't that harrowing, but it was a little it was a little odd. But when I was in the middle of texting you, hey, this this old guy keeps kind of following me out, and he's following me to this little private area hmm. that no one else is at. When I was texting you that, I look up and there's like a reflection, and I see him standing right behind me. <laughs> so like, I almost texted you. I almost texted you. He's standing right behind me. I almost like took a picture. And just like, <laughs> but, uh, um, but my butthole was safe that night. Um, it was, uh, wow. but uh, I, I did That's okay. Time. And then, yeah, but uh, it, you know, it was kind of pretentious. There, there were a couple of cool paintings, but it was kind of pretentious, self self aggrandizing, just sort of mm. like, oh, I express myself through my music. Yeah, you, now watch me expect? express myself you're through at a, You're at an art studio on Melrose Place. I know, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so what do you expect? But the, the following art e exhibition was better. This one was actually in the Arts District. 
Um, so this was Where's this that? was a goth. This was a goth. Where's the arts theme. district? Oh, the arts district is in downtown LA. We have all these districts in LA. So it's like the toy district, the arts district, the fashion mm. district, the Skid Row district. <laughs> Yeah. If you if you're a professional hobo, that's where you go to find hobo right. work. It's so. where you hone your skills as a hobo. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, that one was cooler. That one, you know, at the the uh, they had you know because you know I'm into horror, so there was more art that was related to what I'm interested in. And they had like this fat like fire dancing lady, um, so that was kind of cool. Just she was, she was there just eating hot topics the whole night. <laughs> but, <laughs> hot topics, hot topic. You know the, the store. Oh. Oh. She was eating hot topics. She's eating stores. Yeah, that's probably why she. Uh... Anyway. Anyway. But uh, uh, yeah, so that was that was cool. Um, All right. But... Well, whatever. Uh-huh. I mean, you and I have different definitions of cool, I guess. But we should get into the, <laughs> into the <laughs> t- topics. Yeah. That we want to talk about. I think I have three up here. Uh, yes. I would, you like want to start first? with the well, the th- the Beyonce one. It's right, cool. just the same thing as the Lizzo, the Lizzo, the yeah. Lizzo one, which we talked exact about. same thing. Uh, I get in a way, I kind of like it because it shows that no one is safe from this madness. Yeah. Uh, so I think we should be more specific here. Yeah. Um, basically, when a Beyonce song uses the fir- the same ableist quotes term uh, term spaz, which in this jezebel article you know they're reputable um they say spaz derives from spastic via spastic cerebral palsy is that taken as fact like is that factual i actually wrote almost the exact same note in my in my notes here it's because yeah. like for me and, and I'm, it's, I'm wondering if it's the same thing for you whenever i heard the term spaz it meant for someone who's either like kind of jumpy or like clumsy or like they kind of freaked out or something like i never n- knew it was like it, it, it never seemed like it was connected to someone who had a, a disability. Ever. I yeah. never thought it had anything to do with cerebral palsy. And like a lot of words, they can transcend even their origins. I think we talked right. about that with things like like gay um, yeah. and lots of other terms. So they just say that as facts. They don't cite anything. And right. I've, I've always just used that as like, you're being a spaz. Like you're being rambunctious and just right. kind of all over the place my dad um, used to call me spaz a lot <laughs> yeah i feel like it was a big like 2000s term like yeah, when yeah. we grew up uh i feel like like when i was growing up and i was like helping my dad like fix the car or something and if, and if i like here hold this and if i like kind of fumbled with it he's like hey calm down spaz like yeah well you like, are I never spaz, but oh, i know i know <laughs> <laughs> i you know so i looked at urban dictionary and it said joe garza and i'm like oh it's joe garza um, um, no, so, seriously, actually, like the first few definitions on urban, not that urban dictionaries, yeah. uh, a I don't know how credibility is going to be put into question. But the first few definitions were like it was just someone who's uh clumsy or freaking out or uptight, or sure. like there it was there was nothing that said, oh, like uh, a slur for someone with a disability or anything like that, sure. Um, and they're going to pick you know the definition that that fits their narrative here. Exactly. Um, so was, this is basically an example of them culturally appropriating, like because in common parlance, spaz does not refer to well, that was big that was thing. the argument with Lizzo, and it was yeah. a, a, a yummy intersectional pretzel with yes. one side thinking they're they've got the upper hand, being like, "Ha, we got you. You use the ableist term. You have to change right. this thing because of harm and violence." And the other side said, "Hold up." Hold up a minute. Yeah. That's actually A A V E, right? A yeah. African American vernacular English. Yeah. That now you overwhelmingly, you know, white. Um, I'm gonna use quotes. Allies. Like disabled community. Yes. Okay. Even though the fucking not probably the vast, vast, vast majority of them. Okay. Um, you're using colonialism. You know, trying to colonize our language. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, and I, but I mean, they actually won because Lizzo did change her lyrics, and it looks like Beyonce is going to change hers. I <sighs> honestly don't give a shit what yeah. song this is from. Yeah. It's from the new Renaissance album. Is it Renaissance? Question mark. I guess so. Um, no. Oh, Renaissance is. Oh no, that was a question in this. So Renaissance heated. Uh, and and what? But the thing is, like Beyonce has one of the most 
vicious uh, fan groups. Yeah. And I don't know if they really came to her side. I, this is where it gets so the the oppression Olympics becomes um, very um, spastic here when <laughs> when uh, these groups start going after each other. Uh, I, I would hate to align myself with Beyonce. I find her nauseating. Yeah, uh, I like a couple of her songs, but sure. I mean, in this sense, I don't think she should change the word at all because she's not. I, I don't have to listen to this song or songs to know that she is not making fun of people with cerebral palsy. It's just right. not happening. And yeah. it didn't even yeah. go through her head at right. all. Yeah. Right. It's not even like the N word where it's like, well, I'm not using it in a certain way, but like, you know, it's bad, but no, it's not my intent. Like, no, that's not ha even happening. here. Right. There's not right. a chance that Beyonce is using it for, uh, to, to, to do it to make fun of or right. even reference people's cerebral palsy. Exactly. I'm sure she's using it just in the common slang yeah. way that we've yes. all used it as. Like, I don't think she's like, oh, yeah, this song is about how much I hate disabled people or whatever. Right. It's just like... <laughs> 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 yeah, this came out with a heater about cerebral palsy. <laughs> no, has it gotten there? Come up, it's people's cerebral palsy. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm I'm glad that that you're not a fan of Beyonce uh, because I was because that 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 brings me to the to the subtopic of Diane Warren, who's a, a prominent songwriter. She's been uh, yeah. Who is name who is she? I, I see she's uh, a uh, verified, but I don't really know who she is. Uh, she just wrote a bunch of cheesy songs throughout the '80s and '90s. Uh, she probably she's performer. not a singer. I'm not sure actually. I'm not sure if she actually is a performer. Hmm. Lady, I definitely have heard her name, but I don't know if it's because of. She's I, actually a performer. Yeah, I heard confused with Diane Warwick, who my parents right. just saw in Atlantic City. I was invited. I did not go. Aw. But. Um, um, yeah. Uh, so because there are like, what, 20 or 24 writers on one of her songs? And so Diane Warren went on Twitter and she was like, why so, are there so many writers with one song? So I looked at that and then I don't I, I don't care enough to, to do research on this. So I'm just going to shoot from the hip. And say like the little I did read, it seems like it's not as if 24 people sat in a room and wrote this song. Like I think that's one of the big criticisms, you know, the meme that goes around about um, Taylor Swift's, what, what's that song? Haters gonna hate, 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 yeah. hate. You know, I don't want to get sued for whatever. But yeah. um, uh, like, and it had like a hundred writers or something, like I'm certain amount. <laughs> and then it's like a gorgeous song by uh freddie mercury or queen and it's like and it's this ballad or this song with these really deep lyrics and it's like one writer or something like that but I, I think the argument that the dream makes here which haven't haven't said that singer in a decade didn't know he's still <laughs> around um i like one of his songs but uh he's like well a lot of that has to do with the sampling yeah, so it's yeah. like you have to give them credit so it's like they're i, I don't know and I don't right. care. You're the music guy on this podcast. But yeah, that's, I think that's more of what it is. That's my understanding of it as well. Um, which is, and, and, and to be fair, I can see where she's coming from, where it's like, okay, I'd rather credit, you know, two dozen writers for the song rather than take sole credit for it, even though, even when I'm taking, when I'm using their work. So it's like, okay, fine. You're protecting yourself and you're giving credit where credit's due. But that does contribute to why, I'm sure it's not even Beyonce. It's probably like lawyers being like, "You have to right. do this." Right. You know? It's yeah, um, but it's also it does contribute to, to to my I shouldn't say hatred of her, but like uh, my why I do not like her. And I think the reason is because um, there are uh, so what's her face? Uh, uh, who's that chick? We, 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 we talked about her before. She's cool. Uh, she's got she's the enchantment cool. now, lady. Um, oh, oh, Chloe Valdery. Yes, she's a huge fan of Beyonce. She's like, you know, I think Beyonce can bring us together or whatever. And it's like, no, Beyonce is a mediocrity. And look, here, I'll be generous. She's a talented singer. She puts on a good show. Uh -huh. Fine. But uh, it's like, I, 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 I hate this you. I don't, aggrandizing I don't, someone. I don't get it. I don't. Yeah. Like, if she was, I'm not trying to be a, a hater. Yeah. I really, I love actually one of her songs. Um, I love Formation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a really fun song. I'm also, yeah. I love that it's shot in New Orleans. It's very cool. Yeah. Kind of talks about her upbringing, but mm -hmm. I don't get the obsession with her. Right. I, I don't, I mean, I think that's a lot of people, like people with these fan groups, I don't really right. get the obsession. Um, yeah. 
and for them to be so vicious, the Bayhive, like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I think I, it's more like the fan base that makes me more frustrated with Beyonce because if it's like, okay, she's she's put out a bunch of good hits and she's a good performer, it's like, okay, fine, people love her for that, fine. But it's one of those things where if you criticize her, then then it's that that's sacrilege, and it's like you're criticizing God in their eyes, and it's like, okay, no, she's yeah. not. It, when when and, and getting back to like the, the the twenty writers or whatever on her song, it's like. It, it, one one talented person can can you know like you brought up Freddie Mercury it's like yeah you know a handful of people can write and uh, uh, I don't know it's just I I I just I yeah she's not Mozart she's not I, Beethoven I, I, I know I, I know what you're saying and I think yeah. I tend to agree with you all that being said we actually don't think she should change her lyrics like in the end oh, we yeah. are on her side with this like we're, yeah. we're defending her absolutely in a, in a more logical not in a Bayhive way but in just like I no she. She wrote the song, or her writers wrote the song. She performs the song, yeah, uh, and that should be the end of it. Like my, we my, have, yeah. yeah, my respect and admiration for her would go up if she if she stuck to her guns. It's like, oh shit, you actually have some artistic integrity. Like you're not giving to the mob. You're saying, hey, I, I wrote me and my twenty writers, <laughs> or whatever. I'm, I'm I'm sure it wasn't that many, but it's like me and my my team. We wrote the song. I think it represents my culture or my views or my experience. I'm sticking with it. If you don't like it, don't listen to it. Hundred percent. Radio, and change it. Is that, and it's actually kind of shocking. It's like, this is the one group, whatever this group is, which it's a big tent group of disabled, which I find very offensive, to be honest, considering yeah. there's so many different types of disabled people and, and to pump, right. lump them all together is, yeah, no. is annoying. But um, it's like the one group that can, like, goes, rises above, like, black women yeah. uh, in these oppression Olympics. It's kind of shocking. I'm yeah. actually surprised more people haven't pushed back. Right, uh, right. And, and not that people haven't, but in the end, right now, they're 2-0, yeah, the, yeah. the ableist group. Um, so, And I bet like 99% of them aren't even disabled. Like, it's, it's a bunch yeah, of people they'll, have like, they'll, have like, they'll have like anxiety or something. It's like, okay, yeah. that's a problem. A lot of people have anxiety. Some sure. people it is like crippling, but it's not cerebral palsy. Like that's right, not, exactly. it's not, you know, born with deformities. It's not... Um, down syndrome or something like right in fact there are a lot of people who who have actual like severe disabilities who have a good sense of humor about what, yeah which i think is cool it's like yeah you know like life gave you a shitty hand and you're you're able to laugh at about it. it's like you that takes a lot of guts that's cool that yeah. you're that you're like i'm not gonna ask everyone else around me to walk on eggshells i'll laugh at it go ahead let's make jokes about it that's cool and, and i'm not saying i'm not saying every disabled person should have that attitude like that's you know, but I actually sort of think like, we should only make fun of disabled people. <laughs> 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 but uh, but but you, but you know what I mean? It's, it's like you, you know when you go on Twitter, whenever you see people getting offended, it's like ninety nine percent of these people it's being offended on someone else's behalf. Yeah. When in fact ninety nine percent of the people of that group probably don't give a shit, or even if, even if they are offended, they're like, yeah, okay, I'm just not going to listen to Beyonce anymore. There, therefore, that and that's Latinx. <laughs> That's not it's the best example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, dude. Uh, real quick, so a fucking tell me, you know, some crazy tell activist, me, some activist won uh, the uh, city council of for my district. Some oh like yeah, twenty or early thirty something crazy yeah. Latinx activist won. Yeah. Ugh. And, and here's the, like the, the guy, the, the incumbent guy, uh, Gil Cedillo, was like a very progressive guy, and he kind of annoyed me. But it's like, oh my god, he got not upset enough. by someone. Not I know enough. exactly. Yeah. And he was a Latino guy too, and it was just sort of like, oh my god, like he wasn't good enough. So we need to get some blue-haired activists to, to represent. Is he actually, Eisenhower. Latina. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, but she's like a like, hilarious yeah, bald like, one. Uh oh yeah, yeah, but she's like a member of like the Democratic Socialists of California or some shit. Like, did, did you ever see that video from a few years back, like the Democratic Socialists of California or, or whatever? Like, there was I a mean, meeting. Maybe you might have. You, you, it went viral a while back, but it was they it's were like, having it, some. Everyone trying to out pronoun each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, well, so some. It, it was like uh, so they didn't they didn't allow clapping. So in the, in the <laughs> audience, in, in, in Why? this big gathering, because it was offensive to people with audio sensitive overload. Yeah. Why didn't you know that, Joe? I know, I got it, yeah, but it was just like, but like every time somebody spoke up and said, "Hey, I have a question." By the way, my pronouns are he, she, they, theirs, users, I would have a ding dong, and then like it was just uh, yes. person, and, and they they would open up saying personal point of privilege, personal point of privilege. Um, what does that as mean? If, I guess it means like because you have the floor, you have to like since you have 
the floor. You have to acknowledge that the privilege. So I think I'm I, I'm gonna I'm gonna zig while everyone else zags here. I'm fine yeah. with all of this because it's out in the open and it's yeah. alienating, and these yeah. people will never like win. I mean, like I, yeah, it's annoying that in your district. I mean, it's like a council seat, right? Yeah. And a lot of that, there has been a lot of pushback against that. Yeah. Um. Unfortunately, not in in your area, but watch yeah. them. Like you're you're in a very like legit Latino area of LA, right? Like right, people right. like the a lot of these, um, either first or second generation Latinos and stuff. Like they're not fucking with this stuff anymore. Like they're voting Republican. They're taking over. Same with Asians. They're like taking yeah. over councils again. People recalled. Yeah. So while it's annoying and that sucks, like if he actually makes any changes that are really detrimental to your district, like they'll, yeah. they'll form against or her. Oh, yeah. They'll, yeah. they'll like form against her. And I'd rather have these, you know, cause then these things go viral. It's like, look, these are the people who want to run your school council. I'd rather have that out in the open than it more like hidden and they're yeah. still pushing their agendas. That's true. Yeah. And, and I think that, that is, uh, uh, I heard that as a great defense of a defense of free speech is that it makes, it makes it easier to see who the crazy people are. Sure. Um, so yeah, no, yeah, that, yeah, that's a good point. But uh, um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, luckily it's always, been, office, the argument. It's always yeah. been the argument for like old ACLU. It's like, do you want to know, know who the Nazis are and the right. KKK are right? Yeah, like yeah. instead of them like, like rooting their way and weaving their way into local politics and, and taking over um, different positions of power. Don't you want to know, you know, who's yeah. who, like with the swastika on their sleeve or the hood on their head? Like that's how it used to be. That was such an argument for free speech. Right, right. Let ideas battle it out. And those stupid ideas on the right, now it's mostly stupid ideas on the left, playing on the right also. But like sure. these are the ones that people are going, whoa, wait a minute. Like that's what I'm voting for now? No, thank yeah. you. Right, right. Yeah. I remember, so, so, I know it's a bit of a tangent, but I remember uh, remember Richard Spencer. You know, like he he had a brief. Yeah, you know, he was like a he was, he was like a legit white nationalist. Yeah, like white there supremacist. Was, um, six or seven years ago, um, mm -hmm. someone was interviewing him. Uh, I can't remember. It, it might have been Vice, but I can't quite remember. Mm -hmm. But this per the, the person who was interviewing him kept cutting off Richard Spencer, and kept cutting, like kept being very condescending. And like I'm not defending Richard Spencer here. Like of course he's a piece of shit. But here's the thing: yeah. it's like. Every time Richard Spencer would say, would start elaborating on his ideas, they sounded fucking ridiculous. They, it was just like this, this ethno state, like, yeah, put Africans on their own country so they can do whatever they want. And it's like, dude, that, that's fucked up. But like every time he would start saying something, the interviewer would cut him off. And it's like, dude, let him be an idiot on his own. Let him cut him like, off. Why? Uh, like, so every time he would start saying something, he'd be like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. That's so racist. How could you believe that? And it's like, dude, yeah. Richard Spencer's making himself look bad. It's like, yeah. what's that quote? It's like, it's, when your enemy. I it's Napoleon. He's making a mistake. Yeah, Napoleon's like, stop them. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, let him bury, like, and that's the same. Now, I want to take a step back, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I said applies to groups like like that. Like, yeah. like you voluntarily join the Democratic Socialists of California, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, though, so I, I want to be clear here. I mean, again, because sure. then this shit creeps into places that aren't voluntary like your workplace right. and your university yes. then they make you talk like this and now that, that i'm completely against right exactly. that is you know and then everyone sounds like a fucking idiot and is compelled speech right like like free speech also protects you from compelled speech and if i want to stand up and not give my pronouns and not give my gender and not give my privilege and all that shit i shouldn't have to do it exactly. you know and that, that is the difference right. so i yes. want to be very clear about that yeah yeah totally man um so we can segue into any number of top potential topics that we have lined up for this week you want to do um um john leguizamo yeah let's do the john leguizamo one it's so it's, funny you know it's, it's like sometimes at the beginning of the week when we're like yeah we should record this week what should we talk about it's like shit i don't know it's like something franco, comes out. so so long story short here james uh -huh. franco who i thought was like canceled from hollywood i guess not yeah he's making a comeback um yeah. He is going to be playing Fidel Castro yeah. in a movie called Alina of Cuba, yeah. which is apparently Fidel Castro's daughter, yes. um, who was actually really against his state and, and, and him. And she defected uh, to Spain in 1993. Yeah. Which brings me up. James Franco, I mean, is he not Spanish at all? 
Frank- I just looked it up before we start talking. No, yeah. he's uh, mostly like Eastern European and some Russian Jewish, I think. Where's the term Franco? Where's the name Franco come from? I don't know. Francisco That's Franco what I thought. Was literally <laughs> the dictator of Spain. Like I was just about to bring that up. So yeah, shouldn't there, there's a little bit of wiggle room there, right? Is it like uh, a stage name then? I'm not sure, actually. I'm not sure if that's his uh, real... Well, that aside, I mean, yeah. this is kind of the new thing, and John Leguizamo's upset about this, uh, saying, you know, he's not Latino. He actually did use Latino there, not Latinx. <sighs> but, you know, he's upset that this historical figure um, is being played by a gringo. Yes. Um, I don't know. This is... The same argument we have a lot. It seems, I mean, it's acting like actors, and I don't know where the lines get drawn because this becomes a slippery slope. You know, what is a like an actor? I I say because there has to be obviously some line drawing, right? You can't have. uh, I wish it is a Mickey Rooney. Yes, who who played the the Asian like in in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Yeah, you can't yeah. you can't have that. Yeah, you play a Japanese guy, yellow face. You can't Bunty. have you can't have yeah. me play a, a black person in black. Like I know, like that I understand because these are sure. big groups, right? But the more right. you whittle it down, like where are the lines going to stop being drawn? For instance, because you can make the argument: what if John Leguizamo played Fidel Castro? I believe he's Puerto Rican and Colombian or something. So then, people okay. then when Cubans would argue, well, why isn't a Cuban? playing a Cuban American playing this historical Cuban figure, right? Like, like yeah. the line, like it keeps getting more narrow and narrow. And then, um, so like what a white Argentinian whose last, like whose last name is Jewish. Like I went to, I went to high school with, uh, Argentinian Jews. Argentina actually has one of the largest Jewish populations in the country, in the world. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, that, there's actually a big terrorist attack there on a, on a synagogue back, you know, not that maybe 20 years ago. Right. right. Um, would they count? Are they Latino? Right. What's Latino? Would a Brazilian, would Giselle Bunchen, a Brazilian with German heritage, count? Former Nazis. Yes, former Nazis. Like, like, where do you go? Like, like is someone who's very dark skinned, would a black uh, Afro Latino from Cuba even? Like right, a, right. Or, or the Dominican Republic, like um, Big Poppy or Yasiel Puig. I'm naming baseball players here because that's usually where yeah. you see these people represented the most. Yeah, Black no. Latino. Would they be a pick over James Franco, who looked nothing like right. Fidel Castro, right? Like, so where does where lines get drawn? And I think it's really, you know, it's a slippery slope. And in the end, it's fucking acting. Like, yeah, you, can't, exactly. you can't have John Wayne playing Genghis Khan. I get it. I know. One, yeah, it's also course. like just silly, like it's dumb and right. it's offensive. Yeah, but Latinos are this huge group, an entire hemisphere, basically, yeah. Yeah. more or less. I know there's some exceptions, Guyana or whatever, sure, but, yeah. like Belize. Um, I don't know if they can. I have no idea. I'm not going right. to Haiti. Like, are Haitians Latinos? I don't know. It's a whole argument. Right. Um, like, no, but you're, you're you're right though. It's you know it gets to a point where you're kind of splitting hairs. You're splitting hairs, and where does so it for example, like, I think. Benicio del Toro, I think he's Spanish, but he's no. often played. Benicio del Toro is Puerto Rican, I believe. Okay. Javier Bardem is Spanish. Maybe that's who I'm thinking of. Yeah, Javier Bardem is Spain, Spanish. Right. So does that count? What? It, like, exactly. I lived yeah. in Spain. I went to. Yeah. I, I lived with people who had freckles and red hair, who were span had names that were as Spanish as they come, and yeah. some were very dark, and some were mixed. Some looked like me right. with blue eyes. Some were. You know, it was all over. So, like, would yeah, that yeah. would that count? Exactly. Like, so, yeah. You know, you watch City of God in Brazil. I don't mm-hmm. know if Brazilians count as Latinos. I don't know really. It's a fluid term, I guess. But you know, there, there are, there's actually a difference between Latino and, and Hispanic. It it's kind of interchangeable, but yeah. yeah. But I don't think Brazilians are in either. I don't know. I don't know what that. I don't know because it's like no. You're you're right though. It is. It's so. Um. For example, there is an X Men character comic book character named sunspot and who's from okay. brazil and so he was portrayed by two different actors in the x-men movies um they were both i don't know if they were they were brazilian but i know that they were latino at least um but i remember i think both times people were upset that they, that they didn't get a black brazilian but it's like when you look at the people of brazil it's like they range from like blonde hair blue eyes to, to like black it's like it, yeah. it, it's there's all kinds so sure. it gets 
gets nice. And, and, and you know, in the comics, see, he's always portrayed with, with darker skin. Mm -hmm. But like to me, it, like it never really bothered me that they got a lighter skinned Latino to play this character. It's like, okay, that's cool. I'm seeing you know, you know, a Latino in a prominent superhero movie. That's cool, whatever. Yeah. But it's like, oh, but he, his skin wasn't dark enough. It's like, also, oh. it's also a fucking comic. Like it's not exactly. a real person. It's superhero. Exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. Not, it's, it'd be weird. Like if Fidel Castro, they cast a Chinese person to play Fidel Castro. Yeah, it'd be kind of weird. He's <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. But like, it's a comic. Yeah. So you know, on the one hand, I don't blame people for being bothered by it it's like okay sure you know because hollywood to be fair hollywood does have you know a, a history of you know for example there, there's that orson welles movie where charlton heston played a mexican uh a touch mm. of evil i think was called um so yeah. it's like yeah i can see why that would be a little troubling but at the same time it's sort of like you're right though it's like where do you draw the line because it is acting yeah and also, also here's the other thing so 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 the movie's <laughs> prominent it, it, it focuses more on uh, castro's daughter alina fernandez yeah. Yeah. and yeah. The real Alina Fernandez signed off on this. She, she approved James Franco's casting as. Uh, shouldn't that be enough? Like, you, you think so? Yeah. Shouldn't the first line and really only line of defense for this, or or whatever you want to say, yeah. is the people who are involved, like the family or the person themselves, if they're still alive. Yeah. Yeah. And then like the casting director and the director right. and the, like right. the studio, like that's all that matters. Right. 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 Uh, you shouldn't be. I, I don't know. I mean, you can criticize whatever you want, but this seems like this seems silly. Yeah. Uh, exactly. If James Franco can pull off Fidel Castro, that's what acting is. Yeah, if he looks yeah. like a fool, then criticize him for it and panic. Exactly. Yeah. Like, like yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Um, and go make your own Fidel Castro movie, which I, we don't even know how much he's going to be in this anyway. But exactly. Um, yeah. I, I always know. defend Jack Black in Nacho Libre. I always. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, I mean, no, comedy, I'm dead serious. Yeah, I know. In comedy, like you have more freedom. Like every Mexican I know who's Three seen that, who's who's seen, yeah, exactly, yeah, who's seen uh, Nacho Libre. We all love that movie. We all get a kick of it. Nobody's mad, and I'm glad that that movie came up before the whole woke era came came yeah. about. It's like because I love Jack, Jack Black. Black. Has he like apologized for that or something? I feel I, like he bet he fucking better not. Um, but he I could see him. I could see him I, doing. I could see him doing it. Yeah. I mean, he. I remember when uh, during the 2020 election, he said, "Dude, vote for Biden. Biden's punk rock." And I was like, "Oh, dude, oh no, come on, don't get established, man." Biden is the least punk rock candidate that's ever existed. I know, and it's. I don't even like Trump. It's like, dude, come on, like, don't, don't. Yeah. Like, come on. But anyway, there's a whole other thing. But uh, um, so, yeah, so, I, I hope that Jack Black never apologizes for not. And that's really usually that. the case. Is like, I'm sure the Cubans, if they were going to see this. I don't think they're going like pff, representation. Yeah. <laughs> like, like I, don't think they, I think they're going to love that this well-known celebrity is playing. Well, actually, I, I don't know how much they love Fidel Castro. I have no idea. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I, I like just a lot of these countries that like aren't the major countries that get like stories made about them, right? The yeah. United, the U.S., Japan, the U.K., France, like these these countries that have lots of movies and representation, like. I think they just like being involved, <laughs> just like yeah. having their story told, and they're not going to give a shit that right. James Franco is playing Fidel Castro. Not entirely related, but every year for Cinco de Mayo, you see like the hardcore, you know, like Twitter activist Mexicans getting upset that white people are, are celebrating Cinco de Mayo. Meanwhile, like 99% of Mexicans living in the U.S. are sort of like, yeah, gringos, go go to our restaurant, yeah. celebrate our culture. Yes, give us money. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah go to well, – I, I did see a video on that. And again, this is one of those like kind of street walking videos. So you don't yeah. know what's being cut. Right. right. But he's going up to. So first, I, I think it's a James. Was it the Daily Wire of, thing where he's dressed yeah. up in the sombrero? And yeah. And the mustache. Around. And he's going yeah, up yeah. to like non Latinos or maybe like third generation Latino college students and like the clearly not student. Latinos. I mean, like, is, is this offensive? Like, he's not doing an accent. He's not yeah. doing. He's just like wearing stuff. He's like, Hi, do you find my outfit offensive? And like, they're all like, yes, that's not your culture. It's the yes, colonial, not. Colonial, yeah. Right, colonial, all that stuff, like the typical talking points, the typical crit talking points. And then he goes to, I think this is in LA. So he goes to like, legit, Street, yeah. Yeah, legit Latinos. And yeah. they're like, no, I don't find it offensive. Yeah. Like, oh, like, yeah, it. you're like, so oh, it's good. Funny. I like it. Yeah, good job. I love it. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, and that's, yeah. and now who knows if you did go up to some people and they're like, not cool, dude. Right, right, right. but in, and, in no. Spanish. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, and it's from the Daily Wire. You know, I have 
you know, some things from the Daily Wire I like, some things I don't, but it is sort of like... Is it, was know, it the Daily Wire? It was the Daily Wire, because he, okay. he did something similar um, where he dressed up in, in Asian garb. And same thing, he went to colleges, he went to a college, like, like I think UCL, UCLA or USC, asked a bunch of college students, they said, yeah, you know, nothing more Asian. UCLA. Yeah. yeah, and all of them were like, uh, you can't wear that because that's not your culture. But then he goes to Chinatown, they're like, oh yeah, you dress very nice. Yeah, I like you. Yeah, it looks very good. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, but seriously though, I I think that is you know even if they left out certain things, like I think that's still pretty ninety percent. Like, it's like like ninety percent accurate. Like most Mexicans, it's not. Are it's not, not all of them like pillaging him and taking him down. Like like enough right, people right. are saying like, no, it, it's fine. Exactly, like yeah. we don't we don't care. We have other shit to worry about. It's people have too much time on their hands, yeah, um, no. to worry about this kind of stuff. But anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, John Lee was almost kind of gotten annoying. I like him a lot as an actor, no. but he, he's kind of become when when certain people they get on this track of what? Well, where's the paragraph? It's like he's become um, outspoken, speak out. Took the uh, I, I know I'm rambling here. He's like become outspoken about representation, right? Like that's his thing. When that starts becoming your thing and yeah. every award and every movie and everything that comes out, it's like you got on the representation track. It's yeah. like it's predictable and it's boring and it's right. rigid. And yeah. I feel like that's what he like Riz Ahmed kind of does this more with like Muslim representation. Yeah, I know yeah. it's like every single time it's like, okay. Like, and then actually in Riz Ahmed's fun, he was in a really good a great satire about actually on that list. I was just telling you about, about religion mm -hmm. um, that life of Brian for like Christianity and Judaism yeah, and, yeah. and some others. And for, have you ever seen, um, four lions? I don't think so. It's, it's making fun of like jihadists, like in, okay. one, in the UK. And uh -huh. it's really funny movie, really good. And he uh -huh. plays one of them. It's like making fun okay. of jihadists and yeah, but uh, I, I highly recommend it. Yeah, the uh, the white convert is like super funny. I forget what actor it is, <laughs> but it's like the most intense one. And he, uh -huh. he, he creates like the uh, I forget what it else make up town. It's like the Islamic State of Croydon or something. It's like just <laughs> 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 yeah, the Islamic, the Islamic State of of, of uh, yeah, Le Leicester, Leicester, or whatever it is. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very funny. I highly recommend that movie. It's good. But they're, okay, like, cool. they're like blowing themselves up by accident. <laughs> <So it's laughs> <dumb shit. laughs> like fucking things up. It's good. Uh, it, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah uh, I've thought about this. And, and I know I'm not really in any position to think seriously about this. But like, you know, because you're not I'm really in, in LA. You're not think, think seriously about anything, no, Joe. I know. But at least come at least pretend. Be a friend. Um, you know, like, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a screenwriter and, I, and I'm trying to make it in the film industry. If I ever get to a point, uh, mm. when I have some kind of clout or any kind of prominence in the industry, I really want to separate my ethnicity from what I, from my work and, and, and not because I'm ashamed of it. It's like, yeah, like I love Mexican culture. It's great. But it's like, for me, it's like, I celebrate with my family. I don't want to be seen as like a Mexican filmmaker or a Mexican American filmmaker or anything like that. Yeah. So, oh, like how do you? What are you doing for the Mexican community in California? How are you representation of Mexicans in, in filmmaking? It's like yeah. I don't know. Work hard. Yeah. You know, I, I you know it's it's and, and and I think you know not to get too personal here, but like you know my my parents when they were growing up they grew up as pretty poor Mexicans. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in families where, you know, the, the, sort of, the sort of stereotypical family where they had too many children for, for the household. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, and, you know, like my parents, they got picked on a lot. They, 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 they experienced a lot more prejudice and racism than I ever, I've ever experienced mm -hmm. my entire life. But whenever mm -hmm. I complain about anything in my life growing up, they were always like, yeah, you think your life's difficult? You should have seen <laughs> life when we were kids. Okay. Like they you live a middle class life. Texas or California? Uh, they, they, they grew up in California. Oh, California. In, in the Bay Area. Both of them were in the Bay Area. It's like, yeah, you think you had a hard life? Uh, your dad and I got picked on every day at school. We grew up in poor Mexican families. Mm. Uh, deal with it. Things have gotten better for Mexicans. You can't blame all of your problems on white people. Okay, don't do it. Um, so, so I do. But, I, <laughs> yeah. but, but, but you know, it, it's what, like I, I would have that same attitude of like, yeah, you want to make it in the industry? You want to want to increase representation in the film industry? Work, work hard. Stop blaming white mm. people. Don't blame the industry for holding you down. Like, unless there's a very specific case, like, unless you have proof that, oh, you know, this this studio is holding down Latinos. Mm. Uh, it's like, unless something like that happens, like, don't feel like, oh, there aren't very many Mexicans in, in Hollywood, therefore it's racism. It's like, no, you should have worked yeah. harder. 
It also so. feels like you're much prouder of being like an Angelino now than yeah. anything else. Mm. Yeah. Like, you, you, you're like a Californian, which I mean, teach their own. I don't know how you could be proud of that, but you tend to be. <laughs> I'm just I mean, but, but, but you know, I mean, like you get my point, but like, you know, getting to, getting to your point about John Leguizamo yeah. and like, you know, it's like, that's what you're known for is being like an activist and He's speaking too- out. It's, he's too rich and too successful, and he's bored. And these, exactly, these, yeah. they just want attention. Like these people, exactly, they yeah. just want attention. That's all right. it is. They've, right. they've done it, and they need to not fade away because they're narcissists, because they're actors. They're, yeah. they're successful Hollywood actors. And yeah. right now, it's very in vogue still in, in, the, in those circles to do this kind of shit. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, popular uh, nationwide, it's not. The exactly, tides are yes. turning and like a lot of people roll their eyes. They don't give a shit what right. Hollywood people have to say, but in their circles, it's very much like, Oh, let's listen to the, to the sage John Leguizamo talk about being uh Latino and Latino representation where there could be, you know, 50 Latinos that you could pick up off the street who would disagree with them. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, not really related to, 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 you know, uh, pop culture, but do, do you know the story of how hot Cheetos came about? It's actually kind of an inspiring story. No. Uh, real quick, like it's it came from like a poor Mexican janitor who was working at Frito Lay. And so one day oh, a machine okay. that was making Cheetos overflowed. And so he called he was called in to clean up the mess, you know, like the most, you know, like the stereotypical Mexican janitor guy. <laughs> he took <laughs> I Dios mio. Exactly. Well, here's the he, he got a garbage bag and he filled up the bag with these un um unseasoned Cheetos and uh-huh. he took them home. And he experimented with them, and so have, he, he, he yeah. yeah, and so he you know he came up with, with with the recipe for hot Cheetos, and so he went to Frito Lay and he goes, hey, check this check out this flavor I made, and they loved it, and so they paid for him. He had no college education. They yeah. paid for him to go to get an MBA, and now he's like the president. I don't. This has been a while ago, so I don't know where he's at now exactly. But then he moved up to become like the vice president of like international Frito Lay. You know, like it's like he became it's like this poor Mexican guy who had yeah. one good idea. And he became like the third in command of a huge company. And it's like, yeah, like it's not racism that's holding you down. If you work hard, you will get far in any industry that you work in. It's like, so, so anyway, but, but getting back to your ideas, like, like John Leguizamo is like, dude, you're, you're like in the top 1% of the world. Yeah. Like just make a good movie, entertain us. Like you don't need, you're not an activist. Okay. Yeah. But well, uh, they're, yeah. they're bored and they think I, I like, it's almost like activism has kind of become like, like in college, you know, how you could have a minor. Yeah, it's like activism. Activism is a minor <laughs> now. A lot of people, like they're, not, they're not majoring in it. They're still an actor. They're still a yeah. you know whatever a producer, a writer. But like they all have activism minors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're absolutely right. I feel you know when I was growing up, um, whenever I heard the term activist, that always sounded cool. That sounded like oh shit, like you're fighting cool. corruption. You're yeah. fighting corruption. You're out there in the streets, man. Like you're galvanizing. People, you're 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 speaking truth to power. But now, when I hear activists, it's like, okay, you're complaining about you know, pronouns. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, uh, my pronouns are Demi Lovato for those. Oh, I'm pronouns. sorry. I didn't. I'm yeah. totally sorry, Demi. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So John Leg was on. I watched. I just want to do the. Uh, I, I just want to do the uh, uh, verbal meme. Uh, the rock gif going shut up bitch <laughs> um i watched carlito's way not too long ago that's a very good movie and, and uh i don't you think know, i've seen it I, I, it's I, good dude you like uh, you like gangster movies like mob movies yeah yeah this is, is, it, good is that benicio del toro no that's uh, al pacino as a puerto rican <laughs> 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 well, yeah. So, so is John Leguizamo mad about Al Pacino playing Scarface? Yeah, he's, exactly. Uh, he's one of Here's the, the most iconic Cuban yeah. Latino uh, uh, gangster icons. monster. Yeah, yeah. And here's the other thing: Carlito's Way, which also had John Leguizamo in it, and had Al Pacino at playing like a like an old school, you know, uh, uh, what gangster mafia, guy. What, ma- what mafia is it? Like what mob? Uh, I don't know. It, it, it takes place in the '70s in New York City, and so uh, Puerto, they're Latinos. Yeah, he's Puerto Rican. Probably, yeah, probably Puerto Ricans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They've been there the longest. Well, I'm um, serious. They they have yeah, been yeah. there the longest and seven. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, Cubans, but, uh, but and it's also made by Brian De Palma, who directed Scarface. So when Scar, so so like ten years, right. so it came out like ten years after Scarface when Brian De Palma approached Al Pacino to play Carlito. Uh, um, 
this movie. Alpacino's she's like, no, I already played a Latino gangster. I don't want to do it again. He goes, no, no, but this is a different one. But anyway, it's a really good movie. It's worth watching. Um, it's a different. You're a different one this time. <laughs> exactly. You're not playing Scarface again. Um, but uh, uh, where was I going with it? Anyway, John Lang was almost good in it. He plays Benny Blanca um, from the Bronx. It's a good. It's more of a redemption. Yeah, I'll, I'll say, it, I obviously good. know it. I, I've heard of yeah, it. Yeah. I, I mean, like it's. I, I just couldn't picture. I think I get that confused with. So once upon a time in Mexico. I don't know. Oh. I, get, I, get, I get all you guys confused after a while. I know. Yeah, we're all the same. Yeah. <laughs> get it. Get it. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's a good movie, and I like. And and John Lake was almost terrific in Spawn. He played a wonderful clown demon. In that movie, I have not seen Spawn. I don't remember. You're what not Spawn missing out. Is. Spawn was like a comic book, all black. Yeah, and you got like the white face. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Wait, John what's was the on, one that was... Shaq was in? Shaz- Shazam? No, not Shazam. Uh, it started with a K, didn't it? Like uh, Kazam. Kazam? Yes, Kazam. Where he played yeah. a genie. No, that's not it. That's a superhero thing. I don't know. I forget. Yeah. Well, I, anyway. I got a brain fog right now. No. Um, are are, are so you I'm drinking not, right now? Well, I'm not as sharp as I usually am. No, I just kind of feel shitty. Oh, well, well, I'm drinking. I, I thought you were going to have a drink. It's a Friday. I am. I am have, what do you think? I, I've been drinking this whole time. Water? No. I, I know. You're, you're, you're a vodka man. You're a vodka boy. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. A lot of times I am I'm having some vodka. Good. I'm I'm mixing my liquors right now. That right always goes in. well. Yeah. Rum and whiskey. Um, <laughs> Together? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I call it risky. <laughs> risky, a good one. Um, no, I, I mix. I'm going back and forth. They're mixed with Coke, um, a cola, not cocaine. No. Real quick, did you ever watch those Tenacious D, like the original Tenacious D show from like the late '90s, early 2000s? I used to have. I was thinking about this recently. I actually, bat, this is like going to age me here, but yeah. I remember like at basketball practice like waiting to get to practice like sitting with my friends listening to the same like handful of skits over yeah. and over a lot of yeah. tenacious d stuff like yeah. them ordering at the mcdonald's where i still remember some of these lines where it's like yeah. i'm gonna have a half coke half diet coke i'm trying to watch my figure <laughs> <laughs> like this and we used to laugh and we were listening to the same shit now you like this was before youtube this was yeah, before yeah. like it's really smartphones. I think this was on like an iPod, maybe even burned onto CDs. Just when you were burning CDs, yeah. Burning CDs. And we listened to the same skits. We listened to Tribute, the song, yeah, over and yeah. over. Uh, I was a huge Tenacious D fan. Yeah. If you have HBO Max, check out the original Tenacious D shows. They're pretty funny. Like some, some of the jokes don't quite land. They're quite, they're dated, but like it's, it's the two of them. And there's only like six episodes or something. And they're all in LA. They all take place in LA. But, mm-hmm. um, there's one. There's a frequent hangout that they go to. It's, it's, it's like a in the show. It's a record store, but now it's still there. It's, it's called Captain Ed's. It's still there. It's in the valley. I, it's on my place to, to check out. List. And now it's a smoke shop. But it's still called Captain Ed's. Anyway, mm. um, so Jack Black and Kyle Gass they go to the store, uh, Captain Ed's, and they're talking to this this old school record guy, and he's like this old hippie guy, and he's like he's. He's been a roadie for all these classic rock bands, and oh, I did cocaine with Black Sabbath, and I partied with Van Halen, and this and that. Mm-hmm. And, and then he's so he just so at first they're like, oh my god, you hung out with all these bands, but then after he keeps talking, so they start getting bored of all these cool stories. And he goes, yeah, and then I was hanging out with I can't remember who it was. He's like, I was hanging out with Peter Frampton, and we did cheese balls. I'm like cheese balls. He goes, it's cocaine with cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so that's become like an inside joke with, with, with my roommates it's like dude you're just doing cheese balls man you're going crazy man but uh um yeah you want to talk, you want to squeeze in one more topic uh do you want to do authentic storytelling yes yes let's do that one this um, one is uh why don't you describe it yeah so this is uh uh telefilm canada um which uh it looks like it's an official um, uh, government arts funding thing. So I, I, I do, I, I don't know a whole lot about this, but I do know that in Canada, it's, they do, uh, the, the Canadian government has a lot of funding for filmmakers mm-hmm. and artists. They, they, they're, they're much more into like public funding of that. So this looks like part of that initiative or whatever. Um, 
So they released this thing recently called authentic storytelling. And you, when you hear the word authentic, you might think, oh, cool, honest, true, raw, like personal expression. Mm. Um, that's, not what, that's not what authentic means in the age of rage. Um, it's, it's more of a, a, a woke thing. And so, um, so this is a great example of what I refer to as <laughs> ideological entrapment, where mm. an initiative is put forward that at first seems reasonable and fair and compassionate and just, and you would have to be a bigot, like a hateful bigot to disagree with. But when you start getting into the nitty gritty of it, it's it becomes more and more just ideologically driven. Um, so, 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 so for the first couple of paragraphs, it's like, yeah, you know, like we're all about authentic storytelling. We want to like provide funds for this, this and that, and these are our new values. So it does just seem sort of like corporate nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. But then here's where you go. What is authentic storytelling? And here's the paragraph where it shifts from just sort of bland, community-oriented crap to like woke ideological nonsense. Hmm. Telefilm understands authentic storytelling as shared living as sharing lived experiences in a way that is genuine and honest, especially hmm. for those being represented. It happens when representation resonates as being true and respectful, showing the nuances and realities of those who hold these identities in day-to-day -day life, whether through true or fictional stories. Authentic storytelling is for everyone. So you think, okay, besides a few buzzwords, this sounds all right. Authentic storytelling is for everyone. Cool. I'm on board with that, right? However, here's where it changes dramatically. It is especially important for underrepresented people and groups whose stories are often told or shaped by and for the dominant culture or lens, which can result in harmful stereotypes, false narratives, erasure, and dehumanization. It's like, okay, here we go. Here's, here's the crit speak creeping in. Yeah. Did you see an authentic storytelling can cause erasure, exclusion, and harm? Oh, my God. Erasure. Like, no. That's the... <laughs> like, no, it fucking can't. It's a goddamn story. Like, it... <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. The, the, I, I, you lost me once I read lived experience. You're right, it's buzzwords, but it's also like it, it tells you what to expect. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And we always argue, or I always argue, authenticity is important. Yeah. But that means the is the story authentic to I don't know, whatever it is that that you're how should I say this? Like authentic doesn't just mean that if you're writing or, or portraying something that someone from that exact group or city or whatever it is, religion has yeah. to tell that story. Right, um, right. I would think that someone writing a story about Egypt, if they're like, even if they're like an English person who's lived in Egypt for 30 years, right. they could tell a more authentic story about Egypt than an Egyptian American who's never been to Egypt. Right, you know, exactly. maybe a second generation, or maybe they would just be different stories, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, yes. and what obviously this is going to do is be a be this business is going to just be a gatekeep, gatekeeping, exactly. And, yes, and that's what's really I, I'm all for public funding for the arts. I think that's a good thing. But now when yeah. you start putting on like the government, not to get too political, like big picture political, but like the government should fund things like this, should yeah. fund infrastructure and projects and these things, but that's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. It's, yeah. it should not be having these string, strings attached, especially to art, you know, what should like, like how you should speak or portray something like that's yeah. where you're going to start getting art of authoritarian regimes. Exactly. Which I actually do have a soft spot for a lot of propaganda in, in a fun way. I actually love Soviet propaganda. It's my favorite art. But yeah. like that's all you're gonna get. It's just gonna be boring and the same thing. There's only gonna right. be one, you know, it's just gonna follow a certain ideology. And also to say, you know, if another party comes into power, another group comes into power, they're gonna use this. And then your side is going to be, you know, they're they're gonna say, Well, we don't want to hear from you anymore. Now we only want, let's say, like very pro-patriotic Canada, uh, white Canadian, Christian, whatever it is. So that right. will never happen in Canada, but like you're setting up the foundation for that. So you really right. just want to stay out of it, let the money yeah. flow. That's it. But besides that, get the hell out of it. Right, right. Yeah, no, it's it's um I want to fill out this survey. <laughs> I'm going to. I'm yeah. going to I'm going to fill out this survey. Yeah, please, please. Uh why is my engagement important? By participating, you will be able to provide invaluable just... feedback. <laughs> Uh, and I can impersonate Canadian. I just have to be like a shittier American. Exactly. Yeah. 
Just kidding. We have Canadian. We actually um, have a lot of Canadians come on the show who we love. We love yeah, the Canadians. No. Well, here's the thing: like, like Phil yeah. Gosselin and David Craig, um, you know, are, are, are wonderful yeah. guys. And and but you know, they they they've I, I believe when they came on the show, they talked a lot about their problems with Canada's um, the the Canadian government's means of funding artists. Yeah. Um, so you, you bring up an interesting point about about. Um, you know, authenticity in, in like in storytelling, for example. So for me personally, you know, I'm Mexican. I know I don't look Your Mexican. Lived experience. Exactly. Yeah. I like, think like, you look very Mexican. Oh, thanks, man. You're the first <laughs> person to ever tell me that. <laughs> that means so much to me right now. Um, no, but like, you know, uh, uh, one um, Mexican figure who I would love to, if I ever had the chance to, to, to do a biopic on is Oscar Zeta Acosta. I dare say friend. Chapo. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, <laughs> well, maybe that's, that's kind of a, a pretty cool story. But I would love to do Oscar Zeta Costa or Costa. Um, Wait, the uh, the uh, Hunter S. Thompson's lawyer. Yeah, yeah, dude. He was like, he was awesome. He was crazy. He was like, crazy. Um, Benicio del Toro, uh, uh, you know, he, he played a fictionalized version of him in in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Um, yeah. This guy's wild though, and he was mad that they didn't make him Mexican. Exactly, yeah, because in the book, in, in the book, he, he makes him Samoan, and that was the only thing. Like, there's so much embarrassing right. shit about him, but he's like, no, like, you know, don't make him Samoan, make him Mexican. Make That's him the only thing he's mad about. He didn't care about. <laughs> he didn't care about any of the the hundreds of drugs and violence. And the, don't they actually? I mean, Hunter S. Thompson basically says without saying that he was having sex with an underage girl, or at least he was trying to. There is there is some kind I mean, of incident. It was pretty. Yeah, I, I mean, in the book, he very much is saying without saying he was having sex with an underage girl. Uh, yeah, probably. But that's not what he cared about. And we don't, we don't exactly. condone that. That's not why we exactly. think he's cool. We think he's right, cool right. like a like a figure way, you know. Not in a. Is he still alive? No. Well, that's the thing. He he dis he mis mysteriously no disappeared knows. in the in the seventies, in like the mid seventies. And so Hunter oh, S. Really? Thompson actually wrote wrote an article about this, and I think it was in Rolling Stone magazine about sort of like where is where is my friend. But, you know, because because there were rumors of him popping up all over the world. He was a crazy figure, man. And, like, because he was a lawyer by day. And apparently he was a kick-ass yeah. lawyer. Yeah, he, I actually um, use his line all the time with my friends. I Like, we'll be at a restaurant, and they'll be like, uh, I don't know what to get. I'll be like, as your attorney, I think you should get the club <laughs> <laughs> I said, I, said I love that time. line so yeah. much. <laughs> he says it so much in the book, too. He doesn't say it that much in the movie, I feel like. But in the book, right. he's always saying it. As your attorney, I say take a small bit of cocaine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This just, just, like... just huff, the, huff this ether, like, and then and then drink up on the wheel. We'll be fine. But like, if I ever had the the chance to make a, a biopic about any Mexican figure, it would be Oscar Zeta Costa because he was such a wild, crazy figure. I can't figure him out. I don't think anyone he, can. But like, was he Mexican you know, the, or like Chicano? Well, Chicano. I mean, like he was, or yeah, I know he's part of the Chicano movement, though. Right, which were um, Chicanos were like many generations were like here before it became the U.S. Right, but it's like in the U.S. now, like right, they right. predate the U.S. Like fam, like Tejanos and stuff. Yeah. And I was like, surprise, we're white now. Right. And yeah. right, or am I wrong about that? I, I my inter my interpretation, but but again, this could be like a Hispanic Latino thing where the, where the definitions kind of shift. Yeah, my understanding of Chicano was was somebody who who was Mexican but was born in the U.S. That was kind of like right. my understanding. Right. But like right. I don't know. But anyway, he was part. Of, he was a big part of the, the movement yeah. in East L.A. Um, but like <laughs> there are stories of him because he was a lawyer, and, and even that he got his law degree from like night school or correspondence degree or something like that. It's like he didn't go to Harvard. <laughs> like, right, right. Um, but he, apparently he was an amazing lawyer. And so there were stories of him like getting drunk and doing all kinds of crazy drugs and getting to bar fights and like showing up to court the next night, the, the next morning, <laughs> still wearing the same clothes he was wearing and still win the case. Yeah. Like he was apparently a kick ass well, lawyer. Lawyers, lawyers are awesome. Uh, well, obviously, the best profession. Uh, um, but, nah, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I know, I know. But, uh, um, uh, uh, anyway, getting back to the authentic storytelling thing, it's like if I were to do any kind of story, any kind of film or story that 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 was a, that that was about like a, a you know a, a specific to my culture mm. i would not want it to be something where it's like you know you have to be mexican to appreciate it you have to be mexican to understand it i would never do that i would be like okay this is something that specifically happened in my culture or my history but i would dig deeper to find something about it where it's like you know but this applies to everyone 
like so with the Oscars Ada Acosta thing, where it's like he yeah. was an underdog, mm. um, and anybody can can relate to an underdog. Um, it's, it's like somebody who kind of came from a fucked up background, and but he fought hard, and he he did a lot of good things for for the Chicano movement. Yeah. And it's like you know, like I, I would love for like the most stereotypical like redneck to guy guy to watch the movie. Like, you know, I resonate with this guy. I like that he's fighting the system. It's also, that... it's also just like so superficial. Like, I'm yes. thinking. A, for instance, I think there's way more in common, one, with class, and I know I sound like a broken record, I always talk about that, but two, like, a first-generation, let's say, like, Mexican family in mm -hmm. Southern California yeah. whose parents, you know, let's say it's, like, a 15-year-old kid whose parents don't speak English, um, who work in the service industry, right? That 15-year-old's experience is going to be way more similar to, like, uh, Ghanaian or Ethiopian or Chinese immigrant in in lower Lower East Side Manhattan or the yeah, Bronx, yeah. Um, right. and uh, whose parents don't speak English, who are in the service right. industry, than like a wealthy Mexican family in Beverly Hills. But just right. because their last names are both Sanchez, like they have something more in common. Like exactly. no, of course not. Like that's so right. superficial. Just because their skin colors are more are similar. No, yeah. like not at all. The right. immigrant story is one of the like main stories of America. And whether you go back to like the Jews or the Italians, the Poles, the Irish, the, you know, whatever it is, the Mexicans, the Puerto Ricans, like those generational stories are going to be way more similar than, yeah. than just like, oh, well, we we have similar skin color and we have exactly, the same, yeah. same type of last name. Like, no, not right. at all. Right, exactly. So, so you know, if ever if I were to ever tell a story about like Mexican immigrants or something like that, I would not be, want it to be something where it's like, oh, if you're white, you would never understand. Like, no, like if if you you know if, if you're the descendants of Irish or Italian immigrants, you'd be like, oh, you know, I've heard stories similar to this. This resonates with me. It's like I would want to dig yeah. deeper into the story. And be like, what's the thing that that that's universal? You know, about coming to a new place where you know not you don't know the language, you don't understand the customs, but you work really hard. Yeah. to find your place like that's my, a more universal idea. my grandfather my great grandmother didn't speak english mm -hmm. my grandfather was one of like 13 i think or 12 mm -hmm. or 13 yeah the, my gr great grandfather was a barber like mm -hmm. i just heard recently last week and my dad said my great grandfather only ate burnt toast because he cleaned his teeth like mm -hmm. that's some old world peasant shit you yeah, know, yeah. and like they're going to have way more in common, like that generation, that family. Of course, obviously, the year differences, like the 40s yeah, yeah. and thir like 30, but like that aside, like then just to like a fourth generation, uh, rich or upper middle class Mexican family in, in right. Bel Air or, or yeah. Calabasas compared to like recent immigrants who just came over or just settled here, whatever it is. Like, right, right. but but uh, the, the, this wisdom is just like, oh, we identify as this, so we are all similar, and we can only tell these stories. Exactly. Which is absurd. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. But uh, yeah, man. Um, so so that's why you know it's uh, uh, you know getting back to like John Leguizamo, where it's like, dude, like don't act like you you're speaking on behalf of every single person who came to this country. Yes. If South anyone, Florida, I should like... be speaking on behalf of all Latinos. As, as we all <laughs> yes, <know>. exactly. <laughs> I mean, you're closer to Liberty Island than, than, you know, I Ellis am. Island? So. Ellis Island. Yeah. I have, right, yeah. I have 2.5% Iberian in me. So check that. Uh, well, I got more indigenous than you. Yeah. So. I also have some. I also have some Middle Eastern in me because we were like crusa uh, crusaders, yo. Oh yeah, with this, that's what's up. We went over there. Like, my my parents they they did Shalom. they both did the twenty three and Me thing, and then yeah. and then and then they 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 made the the, the fascinating choice of of getting me the the twenty three and Me thing for did Christmas. You do it? Like, not yet, actually. It's sitting right there. I'm looking. You should right do now. it. I should, but it's funny. It's also like. But you, you guys did it. Like, just, <laughs> <laughs> like just put them together, and that's what I'll be. <laughs> Split the difference. That's me. Yeah. Um, they, they were both actually pretty similar. Where it's like they're both like ninety to like ninety five percent the things that comprise Mexicanness. Yeah, it's like, like Mestizo, Iberian, like indigenous. 
Iberian and, and indigenous it takes up like 90 to 95 yeah. percent of their ethnicity and then like five percent a bunch of random stuff like i think my dad has a little bit of north african in him and my mom has a little bit of southeast asian or maybe it's the exact opposite anyway i've got a teeny tiny bit of southeast asian and north african put it on the resume i know exactly i'm very put diverse I've got, I've got like 50 continents inside of me i have a, i have a little west african in me but we don't really talk about that so oh yeah yeah we're, we're gonna cut that <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't talk about that side yeah. Uh, on that note, um, yeah. Do we, is that it? Oh, let's do an episode on on Zid Acosta. Yeah, yeah. We should talk about. It. So I, I got uh, a couple of his books. Um, I think it's like Rise of the Cockroach People and then the the, the Brown Buffalo. I have not read them yet, but I heard he's a great writer. Um, so I'm looking forward to them. Yeah, we All should right. talk about him. All right, man. Well, uh, stay reckless. Oh, hey, real quick. <laughs> I just want to give a shout out because last night I saw uh, our good friends Sap and Claw Elixir, Brother Nate oh. and Anthony Calkins. Yeah, how was I it? I saw them. It was a good. It was a was good that show. Long Beach. No, this is actually in West Hollywood or West LA ish area. It's a place called the Mint, which it's a cool venue. It, like it has a sort of old school, sort of you know uh, jazz club vibe. It, mm. It's actually LA's oldest performing like venue, like their oldest. Oh, that's like, cool. Like, yeah, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool spot. Very small, very intimate. But uh, they did a good show. Um, there was one guy who showed up, uh, and he looked like. Do you remember, like in Godfather Two? Yeah, you've seen Godfather Two, right? Of course. Okay, good. Just making sure you're you're a true Italian. No, no I <laughs> but have like to. It, the, the the guy that that Don Curry only in his youth that he kills that the the, the guy who he like he usurps. I forgot his name. Oh. He, he's he's the original guy like don he's like but he's wearing i remember he's wearing like this sort of white thing and he's walking suit, around yeah. and people yeah he's right his way so this guy was wearing like this sort of like old school gangster zoot suit thing is yeah, yeah. white with like with like pinstripes awesome. and he had a fedora that was cocked awesome. a little bit to one side bring it back and, like, he's he stood out so so much in this club was he a white guy modern. he was white well he looked white i'll say he looked white yeah. but he, i he identifies but, uh, as white exactly yeah but I was just like, on the one hand, I'm kind of laughing because he was kind of a big, heavy set guy. So he looked kind of like this sort of like this old school gangster guy. But at the same time, it's like that takes a lot of confidence to wear something like that in West L.A. Just like, like everyone's dressed very like, it's, it's a mostly millennial thing. But it's like, holy shit, you just came in like you're dressed in like 1939. Well, we already um, we already went through a uh, 40s revival in the 90s of swing and suit suits and stuff. That's and right. A lot yeah. of people like John Favreau and a lot of people the, the mask. Tried- yeah, try to forget about that. Yeah, you watch yeah. Clueless, they're like dancing to swing, <laughs> like Beverly Hills. <laughs> so people like to forget that we went through a swing phase in the oh. 90s. Yeah, remember the mask was a big part of that. The Jim Carrey was it? I remember it was like, uh, yeah, hey, Pachuco, was right? A real that big, was, like... was it Big Fish, a real Big Fish, or one of those bands? And Ska, no, is Ska no. the same thing? Not really, no. The Ska no, was more of a Jamaican thing, I think. It's got more Jamaican roots, I think. Oh, I don't know. But uh, yeah, but I know. And then then the John Favreau movie Swingers was kind of a big part of that, too. Yeah. But uh, yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Um, Oh, and we suck at fucking promoting ourselves. We have a Patreon now. (laughs) (laughs) And and, and (laughs) sign up for and get some cool merch and shit. Yes. We'll we'll, love you forever. Be sure to add the link in the description. Give us your money. There's hoodies, t shirts, mugs, and stickers. Yeah. All different tier, and if you sign up for any of them, you get my books. Depending on the tier, it'll be paperback or ebook, but yeah. you get it for free. Yeah, so sign up and then email yeah. me, and I'll send it to you. Maybe when yeah. I <laughs> no, but seriously, you, you'll get that also. It's in there. Yeah, buy our shit. But, uh, we love. All you. right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us on the special Fight the episode. Crits. Fight the crits. Fight the crits. Fight them and uh, with, with your ideas. Stay reckless, Ben. Bye, everyone.